Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Liverpool Horror My name is Ben. I'm Simon, and we're from the Super Nerds UK podcast. And we're here this afternoon, being Jason Voorhees with uh, CJ Graham and Ari Lehman. How's it going, guys? You okay? Good, good. It's like double vision, Jason. Stereo, Jasons. I don't think I've ever felt this safe sat next to a couple of serial killers before. It's very true. So, let's just, let's just dive straight in, literally into the water. How did you become Jason Voorhees? And I'll ask Ari if that's okay. Well, it's certainly okay. Well, I was born um, to Pamela Voorhees. That's why I'm Jason Voorhees. No, in actuality, <laughs> the wild thing is Betsy Palmer actually, who played my mother in Friday the 13th, shares the birth date of my actual mother, November 1st, the day after Halloween. Isn't that kind of creepy? And we discovered that. But that doesn't answer your question. No. To answer your question, when I was 13, I was in a comedy about kids who play soccer in, in America. And soccer is not popular in America, so that movie didn't go anywhere. And even though it was a lot of fun to play that role, and I snuck into the audition, um, I received a call from Sean Cunningham the following summer. I was just hanging out, you know, just a kid. You know, I was, yeah, I've been in a movie, you know. And all of a sudden the phone rings, and it's Sean, and he's like, Ari, we've got another job for you. And I'm like, really? He's like, come down to the studio. And I did, and I got there. What happened was, by accident, they handed me Kevin Bacon's script. And the script says, the counselor goes off to make out with his girlfriend in the woods. And I was like, oh, this is the best ever. Wow! And I was sitting there with this big grin on my face. And Sean comes in, he goes, no, 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 no. That's Kevin's script. And I was like, really? And he goes, Ari, sit down. I said, okay. He goes, you're going to be the monster. You know, so I was, you know. I mean, you know, I, I thought the one thing would have been great, but being a monster, that was good enough. So I took it. And that, that's, the rest is history. It was worse things to be. <laughs> so, being like, Iconic Jason in the first Friday the 13th. What, so, what was the, the makeup procedure like? Well, what? Do you want to answer that? Why don't we oh, actually, see yeah, sorry. Yeah. Let's, let's yeah, do it one at a time. time. Do you guys want to go out on a date? <laughs> <laughs> so, let me go back to the question. How did I get Jason? Yeah, <laughs> that's the question? Yes. Is that right? Okay. Oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? No, Not anymore. I didn't think so. No, but it is an interesting story how you became Jason, CJ. It is to a point. I was managing a nightclub. We ran an event on Thursdays with the hypnotist. The hypnotist decided to have a film crew come in for a promo that he wanted to shoot. It just happened to be the folks that it did part four called Little Bex with Ted White. And they said, let's do a scene with Jason coming through the screen to the subjects. And they said, let's take CJ and put his big ass in that wardrobe. They did it, and uh, as they say, the rest is history. Yes. So being Jason, was, what was that like for you on set? Was it your first movie, your first acting experience? Um, well, no, as I said previously, I had been in a movie just before that. No, sorry. That's how I got the role. <laughs> sorry, CJ. But now he's asking you. Oh, I've like, lost. Hey, I'm CJ, man. <laughs> Start Wait till the next show, okay? We'll do better. <laughs> What's the question? So had you been in another film no. prior to that? So I had never been in a film. I had never done a stunt in my life. And even Kane Hodder, our friend, had found that I had never done a stunt. And when he found out, it was like, what do you mean? They set you on fire. He said, well, at the time I was a little younger, 28, 29, a little stupider. And didn't realize the impact of what I was doing. But I was relatively physically fit. I had a good stunt coordinator who put me through all the stunts, and that was one of the characteristics of playing Jason. I had to do all my own stunts. Otherwise, it didn't make sense to have a body double 
and then have to go back and forth between a stunt double and an actor. And I will tell you that playing Jason may sound easy because you don't speak, but I do challenge anybody to put a cardboard face on in one eye and show somebody you're pissed off. I mean, it's easy when you're normal like this. No problem. Tables can be flipped. It's all easy. But I challenge you to look at somebody and give them a look of standing fear where a person turns around and goes in the direction. It's a little more challenging than it sounds. Well, so, you did it all with your body language. All body language. And there's a lot of levels, too, because in part six, you embraced uh, a whole other personality aspect of Jason, too. But you know what? The beginning, where they have you down at the bottom of the lake, I mean, there we share we share some of that wonderful lake lake uh, lake work, as, as we can say. But I didn't have to, to have a scuba tank uh, you know, you had a scuba diver with you, didn't you? Yeah, what I did, in, in part six at the end of the film, Jason was 20 feet underwater. It's an Olympic-sized diving pool in Los Angeles. They black out the walls, and they actually chained me down to the bottom. So when you look at that, that is a real chain. And I had safety divers. I was it's a metal chain? A metal chain. It's a real chain. That's why it's holding me down. I'm standing on top of center block. Safety divers, I'd signal, and they would swim in and pull my mask off and just stick a regulator in my mouth. So, back to your thing about stunts, the association to be able to do those stunts was just as important as having the physical characteristics. There's a we, lot of trust involved there. A lot of trust with your stunt coordinator. For those of you that know, like Kane Hunter, been a stunt man, a stunt coordinator, you really have to believe in the people around you to keep your ass safe. Full costume, full makeup, and everything. Yes. So everything underwater is full wardrobe, no wetsuit, it's just wardrobe. The safety drivers are, we are wearing a quarter inch uh, safety diving suits to keep them warm. And, you know, six, seven, ten hours into the shoot, it gets cold down there, let me tell you. Ten hours? And we were there all night long. All night long. And then we both experienced the lake itself, which was stagnant, meaning there was no filtration to it. And they did have water moccasins and leeches. Those are snakes, people. So water, water moccasins, moccasins aren't slippers. They'll, they'll not care. Those are big black snakes. So, but it was fun. Is that probably the most challenging thing you've ever done then in your life, Jordan? Well, I was going to say I'm married, but no. <laughs> Don't tell Ruby that. Now. Ruby, are you here? Come on. But no, that's not the most challenging thing. I think, again, when you're young, it's fun. You're excited. The endorphins, it's like running. Yeah. You just want to do it. You want to keep going. So, you know, Jason is when you put on a character. When you put a hockey mask on, it's like a light switch. Once that hockey mask goes to the front of your face, you go in character. All you want to do is fuck people up. <laughs> It's quite easy to stay in character then. Easy. <laughs> so how did you guys become become so close? Just through conventions? We're buddies. What are you talking about? I mean, I, the first time CJ and I worked together was in like Arizona. Yeah, but mom always liked him more. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. But we all tell Kane he's the best because otherwise I gotta take him to therapy on Monday. <laughs> It's a family it's affair. Yeah, it's a family affair. We don't want to see Jason sobbing. It's very embarrassing. It'd be a fantastic reality show, like House of Jason. It's just I like that idea. I like that. All the Jasons live together in a house, you know. <laughs> hey, can I borrow your machete tonight? What? His next top Jason. It'd be fantastic. That would work. I think that would be a great idea. The Jasons. So let's talk uh, makeup effects. Obviously, you went through a lot of prosthetics. Well, I got to work with Tom Savini at a very early age. I was only 14, and uh, that was very inspiring because Tom is a Renaissance man, as you know, but has a great sense of humor. And uh, even at that time, he kept a bust of Vincent Price, Bela Lugosi, Lon Chaney, and uh, everybody, and, and Boris Karloff in his studio, even though it was his portable studio. I mean, he really gave me a respect for classic horror. We had to work together for two months to put the whole thing together, and uh, it was just a lot of fun. And so when we did the um, actual
actual makeup, it would take three to four hours. So we would, you know, do that on the set. We'd have to be there early. And, uh, you know, for being a kid, there would have been a lot of cases where I could have lost, uh, you know, uh, my focus or, you know, being was that young. But they, they kept it fun and kept it uh, real for me. So, you know, especially when we did the final sequence, when I was handed the script for the final sequence, it said, Alice's dream. And that sent me into a spasm of anger because I thought, I got my revenge against Alice for killing my mother. But, uh, so I started kind of being a bit sulky and, no, it's not a dream, it's real, it's real. And Savini took me aside and said, listen now, stop saying that because you're bothering Sean. But if you are a ghost in a dream that you would believe that you were real, so just go with that. But in the end, I think that my interpretation is the one that the fans accepted, that a mother's love is so powerful that even though it's righteous vengeance gone horribly awry, it still is uh, something that keeps us sympathetic towards Jason. Would you agree? I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> Mom liked him better. Yeah. I'm just so going to be honest. Go. Mom liked him better. Well, sure she did. She was, he was the baby of the family. Well, Betsy Palmer, the green uh, actress that played uh, uh, Amber Horry, says, we were, we, were, we were close and we were buddies and we would hang out. One of the reasons, though, is because she was a vegetarian and I'm a vegetarian too. I know I don't necessarily look like a vegetarian, but but I'm a vegetarian, and she was. And, and you know, we'd go off for steaks and whatnot, and we would get some lasagna or Chinese food, you know. <laughs> what? It's all lasagna. Pasta. Steak. Pasta. Have you ever tried? Have you ever tried to chase down the wild tofu? I ain't touching that stuff. <laughs> I'll it's difficult to track tofu with the winter. Cow. I'll eat the cow, man. <laughs> Sorry. Eat veggies. I know. I mean, tofu's not that bad. I was a vegetarian for 16 years, man. Yeah, yeah. It's not so This is a vegan. Yeah, how old are you? Well, let's change the top. Late now. 20s. I didn't mean to bring up that as a topic, but I loved Betsy Palmer and still love her forever. It's a hell of a thing. What about the makeup for you? How long did that take? Mine was, you know, at the beginning when we had the maggots on my face, it would take almost three, two and a half, almost three hours to get it completed. Once we got the opening scene where the hockey mask is put back on Jason, it would take about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes, and then we were set to go on the set. So it wasn't that bad. Once we got out of that first scene and the hockey mask was put back on Jason, it became pretty simple as far as I was concerned. And I'm sure people have seen pictures of me sitting in the back of a trailer sleeping. And all you see is my face is all painted up and I'm laying there. But those are just the way it is. You're shooting all night long. Um, you start to get a little goofy sometimes. Uh, you start to scare the cast members as they're going by in the woods. Uh, or you disappear and they're calling you for a set call and you're too busy sleeping in your trailer because it's, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning and it's cold. So, but again, endorphins, adrenaline gets going. And look, here we are 30 years later. All I can do is say thank you to you, the fans. Does the legacy of Jason surprise either of you and how well he's endured and how, and how popular he still is? Well, we had no inkling of that, of course, for the first Friday the 13th, um, you know, uh, but it, it, it certainly is, I would have to say, the dedication of the fans that keeps bringing Jason back to life. Um, you know, when, when I was in high school and somebody came up to me and said, choo, 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 uh, 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 you know, I knew something was up. And I think that uh, we can even look now because it kind of looked for a minute there like, oh, what happened? You know, other other voices uh, took center stage, whether it was Walking Dead or even Michael Myers or it, this it character, you know. But the video game, is anybody out there playing the Friday the 13th video game? Anybody? Raise your hands, be proud, be because strong. This Radio. video game is now the number one video game in the world, and people are playing it obsessively three to five hours a day. They just meet in Camp Crystal Lake, and so Jason is back. What's that?
him in the role, wasn't he? You know, promise about Jason Bull being Jason. That's correct. You can play Jason, you can play counselors. The only thing I object to about the game is that it's possible to kill Jason. He'll always come back. Yes. You just reboot the game. With this being another horror convention program, I have a question I'd like to ask is, have you got any crazy fan stories or is there any any fan interactions that have surprised you or, or think the stories you've got that you can tell us? Nothing too the Stories that we can tell you. Are you <laughs> insinuating something? Well, I mean, the stories you certainly can't tell I, I can tell you this personally, that I, I've seen Jason's this big, full wardrobe come up to my table. This, I'm not exaggerating, you know, you ask them how old they are, and they don't break character. They won't say a word, they just stand there. And the parent will speak for them, they're five years old, and you kind of go, you've got to be kidding me. Five-year-old, great wardrobe, great costume, and then there'll be somebody 65, 70 years old in front of you with the same wardrobe on, saying, I can't believe you, you're my first Jason, I kind of love Jason. Iconically, you know, 35 years later, and you just kind of look at this and go, this has become a worldwide brand that I had no idea, I didn't expect. And personally, I'm lucky. I'm right in the middle of the series. I mean, Derek Mears has done an amazing job. Kid, uh, particularly Kane Hunter's performance, Ted White. And you think about it, I get to be in the middle where I come back like Frankenstein. I get to be in the middle that I get to have a utility belt like Batman. Truman. That's right. I get to come at the beginning and I got a James Bond opening. Pretty cool. I mean, you think about it like, wow. And I got an iconic Alice Cooper do the music for the man who did that. So I get to be in the middle. I get to really be a pivot point of the series as it goes forward. So I'm really excited to see what next year brings when they resurrect and go ahead and shoot it again. And as you know, they were supposed to start shooting this year. Platinum Dunes, I believe is the name of the company. Yeah. They shelved it, and I would assume they're going to put it on the shelf next year and reboot it because it's been since 2009. Derek Mears played Jason since it's, uh, part of the series has come out. And with the success of the video game, I think it's time to get it back in the, on the big screen. What do you think, guys? Now is definitely the time to bring it back, as you said. But would you want to see it as a 30 years later sequel, like Star Wars and Blade Runner, or would you want to see it completely fresh start again? Well, I think one of the things about Friday the 13th is it's not too deep. It's not a philosophical movie. It's not about even the chronology, if you will. It's about people having fun. You know, when they when they first made Friday the 13th. It was about, hey, let's make a fun horror movie that people can watch together and enjoy and kind of revisit. And I think that uh, it's just, you know, it's a scenario that can be, can just be rebooted, if you will. It doesn't necessarily, you know, it's just a fun romp through the woods with Jason and various farm implements. You know, it's like, there's nothing, you know, if you're running away from Jason Voorhees in fear of your life, it's not, you know, you're not going to be, like, contemplating the mysteries of the universe at that moment. That's deep, brother. Deep. Anyway, I, again, it's an outsider looking in, and it's easy to be an armchair quarterback. You know, I saw that play, they should have went to the left, not the right. But I would love to see them resurrect the Jason series and take and shoot two or three movies in a row sequentially so there's similarities to the script and then can them and then put them out over the next three or four years so that we don't lose the vision. I mean, there are some Jasons that weren't as exceptional in the film itself, not the performer. And I think we'll all agree, we see all of our films, be it Predator versus Alien, Halloween, they get a little bit off track. I think you need to stay center field, mainstream. Yeah. But if they could do three of them, maybe use the same director, maybe the same writer, shoot them all during one year, can them, and then put them out, the series would have some substance, rather than each individual director, writer, coming up with the creativity, and then <coughs> lose his focus. So, again, easy as an armchair quarterback, but we'll see what they do. It's a great way to look at it, keep a sense of flavor, right? Yeah. 
have you got I for both of you guys, have you got a favourite Jason film that isn't yours? Isn't each or that? Oh, part six, what are you talking about? If we're one. <laughs> exactly. That was an easy Exclude question, six easy and answer. One. <laughs> My brother from the same mother. Have you got a favourite movie? Part oh. six. <laughs> a favorite horror movie, uh, no, one that people should should watch. Uh, I'm a big fan of the movie called Night of the Hunter, starring Robert Mitchum. This was Charles Lawton's only directorial uh, success, and uh, this in this this is the departure, if you will, from of, of American slasher films from. Uh, like Hammer Horror and what had come before it in terms of more gothic horror films. There's no, um, you know, uh, castle on the hill in this, or, or a group of peasants, you know, attacking. In this one, you have an itinerant preacher going across the country, wooing various widows and slaying them. And Shelley Winters plays the widow that he slays. The image of where it says, hate H A T. that you see in Taxi Driver, that comes from Night of the Hunter. And if you watch Robert Mitchum, he talks about L-O-V-E and H-A-T-E, the struggle of good against evil. And you, you gotta see the movie. There's a great use of music, and it's just a classic horror film. Night of the Hunter, check it out. Um, I, you know, my personal life, I've always been, we were talking earlier about Moore's Call of Lon Chaney. I'll always go back to the 60s, the black and whites with uh, Wellwolf, Frankenstein, Dracula, Mummy. I'll stay with those forever. What about Maniac Cop? I like that cop. <laughs> There's another Maniac Cop called Hell Cop. I like Hell that Cop! Too. Hell Cop! That's what I was talking about. What about Hell Cop? Who's well, seen Hell Cop? Maniac Cop too, though. But that's Who's seen Hell Cop out there? I like Hell Cop. Hell Cop? Let's talk about Hell Cop. Hell Cop? Because he played a policeman in Hell Cop that is, like, really awesome. What's really funny is when I was, I was telling people I was, I was going to be interviewing yourselves, um, someone said, CJ Graham, I can't believe you're talking to Hell Cop. Yeah, not, they, not, even, not even Jason, Hell Cop was the first thing you went to. Yeah, I think, you know, the Hell Cop film that I did was done in about two years after the Jason. Unfortunately, the company bankruptcy had never made a national distribution of the films to theaters. It sat on the shelves for almost 25 years till United Artists, uh, MGM bought it. But the interesting thing, you guys know who Ben Stiller is? He's got about five seconds in it, I kick his ass. <laughs> True story, mom and dad are in it too, just you know. Anybody remember Lita Ford, the rock and roll singer of the 80s? She's in it. How about Christy Swanson, Buffy and the Vampire, she's in it. Uh, Chad Lowe, Rob Lowe's little brother, is in it. And you remember Patrick Virgin sleeping with the enemy opposite Julia Roberts, the husband, the psycho? He plays the devil. So it really did have a cast of characters, but when they bankruptcied after it got on in the can, it just sat on the shelves, like I said, until United Artists and GM bought it. And just in the last year, year and a half, it went to Blu-ray. So it's kind of interesting, but a lot of people come up and they realize I was a helicopter and they go, you've got to be kidding, man, I love that show. It's just one of those things, if you don't get that national distribution to a theater worldwide, you know, it doesn't really get the recognition you hope it would. But now fans, uh, people who come to horror conventions will probably take the time to seek that out and find a juicy little fun uh, horror movie. And what I do you did, think? I did. I had people today already come up with the Blu-ray to get autographed and oh. take pictures of my old guy. So... Fantastic. Would you reprise Hellcop if you were given the opportunity? I'd look at it seriously. I'd look at the same thing with the Jason character. I would look at it if it was offered, but I would only take it if I could perform up to the standards of what it requires to keep the series going strongly. If I didn't think I could perform and deliver what's necessary, I'd pass. Just because I don't want to damage what we've already done. But I would look at it. I mean, I'm still... I would think physically fit where I could probably do it, but at the same time, if I couldn't give a performance that met expectations, meaning yours, even more important, my personal, I wouldn't do it, but I would seriously consider it. Or it could be a modified version. It'd be like, Hell Cop at the Donut Shop. <laughs> <laughs> He's old now, a little jaded and ornery. It's, 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 the, it's the vegan food. <laughs> Tofu makes you crazy! That's it, tofu. I have to look for something out there.
Hulk Hogan versus the Vegetarians. <laughs> 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 oh. if, if you could play any other character, who would you do? Either Flab the Impaler or Svengali. I think Flab the Impaler would be pretty cool. Yeah. I don't know if there would be a character specifically. Um, again, you have to realize when you're big like me, for those of you that are my size, 6'3", 245, there's limited acting abilities because normal people are normal size, 5'11", 6'0", a big ass stands up, nobody wants to stand next to me. But I always thought it would be fun to play Halloween, Mike Myers, play Predator, Play, you see what I'm saying? And be able to play each one of the characters, Leatherface, and be the quote unquote back to Lon Chaney Morris Carla of the series because you can step into all those categories with my physical size and capabilities to do the stunts. That would be cool, and that's where I think you leave your mark on the history, just like Morris Carla and Lon Chaney did. Great right, answer. That's something we're missing these days. There is no iconic feature performers or monster performers. None. There's not one that you can characteristically say is covered them all or who they call when it comes to set of prosthetics. You know, I mean, a lot of people come out of good things. You may not know this. Derek Mears, the hills have eyes. You've seen Predator out there and stuff. They've done a lot of things, but not one is really capitalized on every time there's a large character. I don't care if it's in Star Trek or whatever you call C.J. Graham or you call Derek Mears specifically because they know categorically they can do the stunts and they can put the prosthetics on and the wardrobe. Fantastic answer. Don't joke, it's just a joke. I was going to say, I don't know. He just works with game on the top all the time, doesn't he? Being in different degrees of fish men at the moment. <laughs> so what have you guys been doing lately? Let's talk, let's talk about that. Um, I now have a band called First Jason, in which I play a guitar that's on a giant machete. <laughs> it's cool, it's a badass. You should see it, I've seen it. He's brought it to photo, and it's very cool. Thank you, CJ. And uh, our last video, um, we recently were signed to two different labels, uh, Eternal Sound Records in Germany and Cats and Jammer Records in New Zealand. And our new album is called To Be a Monster. So check out the video, First Jason, To Be a Monster. It got over 15,000 views in uh, about a week and a half. So it's really, uh, we've kind of turned the corner and, and there's a lot of great things. And the band now, practices every uh, week, which I'm proud to say, because I'm, I'm also the art director at a community center in Chicago, um, where I have an auditorium and a stage, so we just use the stage and we practice every week, and we've uh, gotten uh, great sound. So I'm, I'm very proud of the band right now. Please check us out. First Jason, that's the main thing that I did. Fantastic. What type of music are you playing? It's rock and roll, man. Rock and roll. CJ. I think most of you know that over the last 25 years I've been running casino resorts. Most of you know I've been a general manager, chief operating officer, so I run operations worth a half a billion dollars, 2,500 employees. This year, in February, I retired. So I don't have anything I have to do. I'm just enjoying myself, doing whatever I need to do. I'm able to do conventions now to meet the fans and show my appreciation for what I've done and then see you guys. But for 25 years, I ran casino resorts. I worked for Hard Rock, I worked for the Palm, Steve Wynn, I worked for Caesars. The last eight years running casinos in California. So it's nice just to step back and take a deep breath and say I've done it. Uh, hung up my suit and tie, so to speak. Um, actually, I've given them all away. I still have three hanging out, but I gave them all away, all my ties. Thank you. So, yeah. But I, uh, for those of you who've gone online, I'm sure you've seen me in a suit and tie running those joints. But now I'm just trying to enjoy myself. And um, we'll see what happens in my next phase of my life. I think that speaks volumes that he can be doing anything he wants and he came out to see you people. I think that's it. my new point. Did any of your employees know of your Sandy Keller history? Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it, you'd be surprised, you know. I never got a complaint from an employee. I had a machete on the wall in my office, and there was, it says, any complaints, take a number. It still was on number one after I left. 
nobody ever complained, but I cannot tell you how many times we would do functions for the employees, the team members, or they had family members who were huge Jason fans. And, uh, you know, I had a drawer full of photographs. I would sign for them and send them home with them. And we also did a few Halloween parties at the different casinos, which I was able to invite people in. Tom McLaughlin, who was the writer and director, also plays in a band, came in New Year's night one night and played at one of our resorts, Slaughter's, the Sloss, with his band. So, but yeah, everybody knew it used to be not a, not a funny joke, but even my, even my chairman would introduce me as Jason, and I'm going to meet the Chamber of Commerce or a bunch of politicians and mayors, and they, yeah, our, our general manager is Jason, you know? <laughs> and I would, and then I come up in a suit and tie and I started addressing all these folks and they're thinking, well, he was Jason. <laughs> so, go figure, right? Talk about me in the opposite. I mean, happy smiley face one day, and the next day I would kill 18 people, and not a problem. So what made you go back to, like, real life, like working in casinos? Why, why did you not? Well, for me, I mean, I'll give you mine, because I said earlier, my size, my statue, I knew was always going to be against me. So I knew after I had done some commercials and a couple jobs that I was like, there's limitations with a guy 6'3", 245. And I said, well, let me go back to the casino industry because I'd already been a dealer dealing perhaps 21 roulette and build my career up, which I did. I went back to Las Vegas and I stayed there for 20 years. And then the last eight years of my career was in uh, uh, California, Northern California and Southern California. So that was my opportunity that I said, you know what, I'm going to be realistic about this. Take the money. Thank you. And now I'm back. He's back. The man behind the mask. <laughs> Does it work? It does. Are you going to yourself? Oh, oh, sorry. So what made you go from acting into another career? I'm sorry, but there's a bunch of red balloons over there. I'm very sorry. There's going to be the clown in us wow. really disappointed, isn't there? So you were saying what? What made you go? Set the balloons. What made you give up acting and going to work music? And oh, well, you know what? Even on the set of Friday the 13th, I had kind of decided I wanted to be a, a, a piano player. I started playing jazz piano and I found that I, I, I had a talent for that. And I just, you know, love playing music. The feeling of standing in between a kick-ass band and a screaming crowd, you know, you can't beat that. And it's mildly addictive. And uh, so I keep wanting to do that. But when you're a young person on the set of a film, there's a lot of waiting around. And, you know, it's like, walk in the room, they turn on the light, and you say, oh my goodness, and cut, and now, okay, let's shoot that again. You walk in the room again, you turn on the light, oh my goodness, you know, cut, shoot again, different angle, you know, it just goes on all day. So for me, I mean, I'm, I'm a Taurus, and I'm not that patient, you know, I just want to get in there and do things, and I found that um, leading a band and being a songwriter and, and a singer has been the right choice for me. Um, but I have recently done some acting. I, I was in a, a, a great little independent film called The Barn. I don't know if anybody's heard about The Barn out there, but I play Dr. Rock. In, in essence, I play myself. He's a video DJ from the 90s. So it's like, you're on the rock block with Dr. Rock. But definitely go check out The Barn because uh, it, it's a great uh, horror film. And then, I was recently cast in another film as a clown, as a as a murderous clown in a movie called Clown Motel. But so I have a lot of fun doing those uh, independent films, and I basically just eat the scenery because hey, it's an independent film. If they, if they uh, when they do remake Friday the Thirteenth, if they ask you to come out, would you do that? Oh well, of course. You know, I mean, I would be happy to be a part of that. The thing is, though, what I feel in that case is. You want to maintain the fear concept. You want to maintain the scary line. And if someone's like, oh, there's Ari. He's got a band. It's a whole oh, wait, no, Jason's G, you know. I mean, that's what took me on to Halloween a little bit, to be honest. I mean, it's too many cameos, too many notes. I won't disagree with you, he said diplomatically. <laughs> but I will say that my buddy, Dago Fink, who played little Michael, did a pretty scary job, wouldn't you say? The young, young Michael, I think that scene was pretty chilling. So, there's some moments in there. Yeah. I 
think, if it's okay, we're going to open up to the audience for some questions and answers. That's okay with you guys. So who's got a question for Jason? Right. Come on, it. Simon's coming to get you. Keep your hands up if that's okay. Hello. Hello. With the, the talk of remakes and sequels, etc., apparently the, um, there's a court case going on over in the States where Victor Miller and Sean Cunningham are in back and forth as to who owns the actual rights to Jason Voorhees itself. Obviously, Sean Cunningham owns Friday the 14th, 13th, but Victor's saying he owns Jason Voorhees. <laughs> Weigh in. Any, have you heard? I wish they would just stop bickering. You know, I hate it when people fight with each other. I think Victor has good good cause. Sean has good cause. Um, but I think that it's time to, to, to bury the hatchet, just like Jason would, and hopefully not in somebody's head. And I don't know anything about it. I run casinos. It's so. better to not know anything about it. <laughs> Seven out, line away. But um, it's time it's time for them to patch it up and, and move forward. In my opinion. Anybody else? Hands up. I've got a real easy one for both of you. What's your favourite Jason kill? Favourite Jason kill? Yep. Wow, that would be when CJ is in the Winnebago and the whole thing torches on fire and that was my favourite. My favourite is breaking the sheriff's back. Yeah, and, that's and the reason for that is it's, it's not about the blood and guts, because we can do more all day long with blood and guts. It's the power that it took to break somebody's spine in half. Oh, that's uh, mine's a Good afternoon, Liverpool. Caroline from Rosemary Dixon is now commencing, followed by Damien Thomas, then CJ Graham from Dixon, and then the other set at 3 p.m. I think Thank it you. says a lot about all of us that were sat here and he's gone, my favourite was when I broke someone's back. It's <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Hi, I need guys. a hard con. Hi guys, I was just wondering, did you ever get to keep any props from the time on the film at all? Oh, I wish I had. Um, from Friday the 13th, Tom Savini has one. I still have a hockey mask. I had two, and I sold one. I still have the opening hockey mask from the James Bond scene. Wow. That's pretty nice. Like, any more questions? Anyone else? At the back there. Stand up. There you go. Hello. Um, in part six, did you get to meet Alice Cooper at all? Of course. I did a video with him, Goofy. <laughs> I got pictures with him, you know, but hello. What was he like? Same as he is today. I, I meet him occasionally at shows. I met him uh, about almost a year ago next month in Chicago. The guy is so down to earth. He's the same person he was then. Um, he was my first concert I ever went to when I was in 1972 and I was just like 16. So it was kind of iconic that he got to do the movie. But he is just as pleasant today as he was then. He's a very cool guy. Any more questions? One down here. Hi there guys. Um, I'm putting on a horror double bill next Friday, 13th, and I chose number six, so that's the best one. Um, but with you mentioning about the back breaking scene, it's the sense it's chopped that film a bit. How do you feel kind of about you know the portrayal of graphic violence in the actual areas? So I heard half the question. Yeah, yeah sorry man, if you hold the microphone, sorry, it was dying. <laughs> um, the portrayal of graphic violence now compared to back in the 80s because number six was chopped up to bits by the censors. Oh, did that? Well, they're saying that uh, they say that when they brought Friday the 13th over here and chopped up by the censors, it's only. Oh, you got you got the chopped version. Did you know what? Um, to be fair, part six had a lot of a lot a lot of gore in it. Uh, in those days, they used to actually cut it on the floor and it went in the garbage. Today, they keep everything so they can come back and do what's called the director's cut. But I do know yeah, it was cut quite a bit, even in America, before it shipped overseas to Europe and stuff. 
So what they did cut out, you know, it was significant as of today, it would be totally acceptable. Um, when I pull Horshack's heart out, for instance, there actually is blood gushing out of the artery and it just kept pumping, it was really cool. I mean, it was a good scene, good graphics. Uh, Tom Savini would have been proud. Um, but at the same time, they took it out because it was too gory, it would have had to have an X rating at the time. Wow. Yet today it would be acceptable. It's too bad. Any more questions? Oh. Come on, there's gotta be someone, a few more questions for Jason. Is there anything, is the scale of or scare Jeff? See what? <laughs> is there anything that scares you or you're scared of? Well, of course there is. Um, spoiled tofu. Mainly. Very frightening. I'm sticking with steak, and that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> no, I mean, in truth, um, wow. I live in Chicago, so not much scares me. But, you know, um, I think that... Uh, I, personally, my favorite horror movies are like, I love silent horror movies, I love uh, uh, movies that are about the occult and the afterlife. So that's, that's kind of, you know, I find that more frightening, let's say, like The Exorcist, I find it very frightening. And I think, you know, I, I like horror movies that have a sense of reality to them. You know, like a Jason, I mean, Jason could be a real person that's freaked out and or Leatherface, you know. It, you think about that? That's scary. Next time you answer your door and you think it's a pizza man, pizza girl. So I think anything that has reality attached to it that truly could be done by a sick individual, that's frightening. It's because it's reality, it's possible. You know, I, I think, you know, Freddy Krueger, those are, are good films, but that's the dream. And we all know it's a dream, right? And anything is possible in a dream, so you can continue that genre forever. But something about a real human being that could really be a mass murderer, you know, and there have been some out there, let's take a look at it. So, that's what scares me, is just the one that you really can't tell. It's like that young man next to you, Lewis. He looks so calm, but he's 10 years old. What's going to happen when he's 19? They got the H.H. H. Holmes movie, which they're going to be shooting now in Chicago, and uh, about that, that wonderfully insane and terrible killer. So that might be a good one. Yeah. Right, Lewis? Oh, man. Y'all have no idea what I'm talking. Lewis, stand up and take a bow. No. Lewis, stand up. Show them who you are, brother. No. Jason, 2028. There you go. All right, who's got another question? We got a few more minutes. Anyone else? What's your question? Spit it out. Yo. Considering you're the remake, you're going to go back to that. Who do you think would make a good Jason? How about The Rock? I think, you know, who should do it? Is that what you said? So, I mean, Derek Mears did the last one, and I think it isn't public, but in my heart, I think Derek was probably going to do the next one. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, they need to find the right character, going back to what I said earlier. I would love for them to pick one guy for the next two or three and shoot them all sequentially and make something that has some substance. You know, so it's not just shelved each time with an individual. But I think Derek did a fine job. I think Kane Hodder would jump at it again in a heartbeat. I think Kane has put his blood, his life, for 25 years, he's been out there every weekend doing these shows. So I think he's been a great ambassador to all the Jasons in the series, iconically. So I gotta take my hat off to him if he was given the opportunity. Um, and again, I would look at it, but if I couldn't deliver, I, I wouldn't step into the role because I would, I let myself down, and that's, that's not going to happen. Right. Um, what's the um, gap between your films one and six? Um, what do you think about with part one? No, there's not a big gap. It's two, three, four, five. <laughs> <laughs> the gap In is the just... Yeah. <clears throat> um, by the time part six came around, um, some of its humor started to creep into the series, such yep. as the smiley face kill. 
Yeah. What was your opinion on that one? Did you think it added to the series? Well, I think that uh, Tommy McLaughlin took a unique approach, and I think that it was it was time for that. I think that uh, the first movie, of course, plays upon the mystery of the killer. You see the kills, but not the killer. Um, by the time we get to part six, we do know who the killer is. So I do think that a bit of uh, tongue-in-cheek humor, um, uh, which had to be done well and was done well. You know, it could have gone horribly wrong, but Tommy and CJ and everybody who brought that in, I thought, did a great job. So it was effective, I felt. I think also, if you think about it, uh, part one, part two, you know, they were still... The Jason character, the series itself, wasn't sure what it was until part three when Richard put that hockey mask on. Yeah. So you have to look at it how it's how it's developing, and then if you think about it, once part six came out, it became more still about the camp counselors, but it's kind of shifted now to the principal is Jason. If the hockey mask isn't in there, you don't have Friday the 13th. Um, but if you think about part six, there was no nudity. There was a little bit of humor. There was some great kills. And at the same time, it kind of was a different gender taking a look at it because it had some of the old uh, 60s series and then it was setting up for the next series to go forward. But again, if you think about it, part one and two is still in development of what the characters were going to become and what the audience was going to take away from it. And as you see, part three, the audience had picked up on the hockey mask and Jason became the principal. And it, it just went forward since then, and here we are, in my case, 31 years later. And it's still a huge, iconic image. Thank you very much. And that is all we have time for for this afternoon. So guys, give me a big, big round of applause for CJ and Harry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.